Um, so hello, yes, my name is Jeremiah, and I'm going to be talking to you about a project called Empty Bowls today. Uh, it's a project that brings together two things that I'm particularly keen on, which are food and ceramics. Um, I've had a real interest in food from quite a young age. When I was 12, I asked my parents for a particular gift for Christmas. I dropped loads of hints because I was a big fan of pizza. And fortunately, they indulged me, they splashed out, and they bought me my very own giant-sized pizza cutter. And that sort of sent the template, template for me as I was growing up. I was I'm really trying to find ways to explore food. Um, and a, another clear memory for me was coming home from school when I was about five or six from primary school. And the house was filled with just the most incredible smell. I, I, I couldn't identify it. I never smelled it before in my life as far as I was aware. But it turned out my mom had baked bread. And that was shocking to me. I, I, it was like she had a created some sort of magical alchemy in the kitchen. I didn't know it was possible for people to make bread. I didn't know where bread came from. I just assumed it came from the supermarket in a bag, and that's what you ate. And my mom had actually made some. So that just totally blew my mind as, as a young man, young boy, uh, thinking that it, we could actually make our own food. And it, it, was, it was a real revelation to me. But the other thing that really stuck with me was the fact that it tasted. I kept telling my mom, Mom, this tastes like real bread. It, it tastes like real bread. I couldn't get over the fact that she had made something that tasted as good as what comes from the supermarket. And what's really stuck with me was it actually tasted better than what came from the supermarket. And I couldn't, it just, I, my little brain couldn't comprehend that she had actually made this in the kitchen with her own hands, something that was normally mass produced. And it really got me thinking, it took me many more years to come around to it, realizing that actually what we make with our hands can be so much more powerful so much more interesting, more, more worthy, more tasteful than things that necessarily are mass-produced. There's a magical alchemy that occurs when we make things by hand and we, we then use them. And that led me to thinking many years later that what else can we make with our hands and uh, that's uh, related to food? And I started to look at things around food and, be and looked at the vessels that we eat our food off of, that we cook our food in, that we drink our food from, and began to realize that actually that's something that I could have a hand in making as well. Not just making the food, but making all of the things that surround food. And that led me to my interest in ceramics. I became very keen on the fact that there there's, again, a sort of magical alchemy that can be occurred in taking this mud and transforming it into something solid and something really useful. And I became fascinated with the potential for ceramics, and began to doing lots of research, a lot of reading, I began talking to people, I took night courses. Um, I definitely, I live in Cornwall, and I spent the winter taking long hour and a half drives through the dark winter lanes uh, to get to an adult ed college so I could take some courses in ceramics. Uh, I, I met a potter, actually, who lives quite close to me, which was really serendipitous, who taught me how to throw for the first time. Um, and I found that I was just consumed with a desire to learn as much as I possibly could about the world of ceramics, where it comes from, the history, what the materials are. And I found that actually, in, in, as is often the case with things that, that, we, that we, as humans, we create, things that we love, with food and with ceramics, that there are, there's often a cost involved. And I became interested in exploring what that would be. What's the energy cost of producing ceramics? What's the energy cost of producing food? How do we produce food? And as I started to look into this, I began to realize that actually th there are a huge number of issues around food, and a big one is food waste. That there's a, th the way that we produce food and the way that we distribute food generates a vast amount of waste. And that got me thinking, well then, if, if I'm a part of this, I'm a part of producing things and wasting things, maybe there's something I can do to help f refix it to some level, that there's some role I can play to help diminish the effect that I have. And in looking around on the issue then, particularly around food, I came across this organization. It's a charity. Hi there, come on in. This is a charity called Food Cycle. And I, I'd never heard of them before, but I was, as I was reading about them, I thought, this is fantastic. These guys have developed a really simple, really exciting way of dealing with not only food waste, but also food poverty and social isolation. And it's a really simple premise. They, they have what they call food hubs based all around the country in different cities. And each one is basically just a small group of volunteers. Hello, hi there. Uh, so we're talking about food cycle here really quickly. And uh, they, they just organized volunteers to create meals for people who are in need. And the nearest food hub to us here 
is uh, either Bath or Bristol. Those are the two nearest ones to us. And I actually went up to visit the Bath Hub to see how they do what they do. And I found it absolutely exhilarating. They, in the morning, usually on a Friday morning, they go to the supermarket. They have a standing agreement with Sainsbury's. And they go into the Sainsbury's and they collect any surplus food, food that's going to be taken from the shelves and put in the bin. And it's a huge amount that happens on a weekly basis because legally, the supermarkets are not allowed to sell food past its sell-by date. So there's legal requirement to take it off the shelves and, and get rid of it. But that food is almost always within its use-by date. And it, there are technical distinctions, but it's in a very narrow space between those two dates. But between its sell-by date and its use-by date, the food is still completely viable. It's completely healthy to eat. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. But because they're not legally allowed to sell it, it goes into the bin. But what Food Cycle do is they sweep in and they collect that food that would go into the bin and they take it back to a community kitchen. It might be in a village hall. It might be in a community center. In Bath, it's in a church, uh, church hall in the kitchen in the back. They take that food and then in the evening... They get together, the rest of the volunteers, and I, I join them on this evening. They look at the available food, and they decide what the menu is going to be based on what's available. It is genuinely like Ready, Steady, Cook, but for real. There are no cameras, but the, the, you have a time limit. You've got about two hours to take these, these ingredients, devise a menu, cook it, because you know that within a, f a few hours, people are going to be coming in the door expecting a hot meal. So we had a look at what we had available. We devised a menu which was actually quite exciting, and we had a lot of help. The gentleman in the middle with his hand on his hip is Fran, who is a local chef who, who runs a local cafe, and he gives up his time as well to come in, and he just kind of oversees what we're doing. He has a look at temperatures and timings, making sure that we keep things ticking over, make sure that the meals we come up with are nutritious, and we start breaking into teams and start making our food. So we had a team on starters, a team on mains, a team on puddings, and we're in a tiny kitchen. There's seven of us negotiating around, you know, borrowing knives and borrowing pans, trying to wash things up so we can use them again. I fortunately had the opportunity to be in charge of, pu of pudding, so I made a lovely bread and butter pudding, which I <laughs> was very proud of, actually, on a scale that I'm not used to working on. Two massive catering trays full of bread and butter pudding, which is brilliant. And we fortunately were able to get it all together, ready to, ready to serve within a couple of hours, and it was ready for when people came in. And it was a lovely three-course meal with lots of fresh fruit and vegetables. And it was completely vegetarian as well because they can't, for legal reasons, use meat because obviously there would be potential hygiene issues with that. So we had a fantastic, lovely meal made from food that would have gone into the bin. And it was served to people who were in need. So they were dealing with two issues right there. There's the food waste issue and there's the food poverty issue. Because anyone can come along, but it's primarily aimed for people who are struggling to make ends meet in terms of their diet. And the third thing that they're doing, which I think is really fantastic, is that they're encouraging people to come together and share a meal. And I think that's a really, really powerful element that, that, um, that their model encompasses, because they're encouraging not only the people who are in need to come together and eat, but also members of the community who are volunteering are coming in and sharing in that meal. So the volunteers who helped cook it are sitting down with them. And there are also volunteers who come in who are uh, hosts, essentially. They're there to make people feel welcome and encourage them to come in. And they all sit down together. And there's a lovely sharing of, of a simple meal. And I thought, this is just a, a fantastic model. What a, what a great, simple idea. It doesn't cost very much. They're dealing with stuff that's already going to go in the bin, so it's essentially free. The, the, the volunteers who take part get a bit of training in terms of food preparation and hygiene and so on. Uh, and, and members of the community benefit as well. And it's just such a simple idea. I thought, this is brilliant. I'd really like to do something to support that. And that's where the empty bowls idea comes in. Empty bowls is, again, another really simple, really powerful idea, which I was so excited to come across. It started in the mid-'80s in the U.S. with a high school teacher who taught ceramics. And this, again, is one of the things I loved about it. It brings together two things that I'm very passionate about, again, it's the food and the ceramics. He was a high school teacher. He taught ceramics, and he was looking for an idea to work with his students to help them engage with the community on some level. And he figured, well, we're... <laughs> Okay, so um, 
what, what he was doing is he, he, was, he was trying to find a way to, to help the students engage with the community. So he figured, well, we're good at making bowls. Why not, we, why not make some bowls specifically to sell for charity? Which they did in their first year. And it was, it, was a lovely, it, it was a lovely event to do. They sold a fair amount of bowls. They raised some money. The next year, he thought, let's take this a little bit further. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And instead of just selling bowls, they decided to host a meal in which they got local businesses to donate soup and bread. And people came along and were served a very simple meal of soup and bread in a handmade bowl. And this was all in return for a donation to charity. So the proceeds go to charity, and everyone who attends the meal comes away with a handcrafted, handmade bowl. And I thought, again, what a fantastic idea. It, it's, it's something raised. Everybody wins, essentially. I know I would have loved to go to one of those. I I'd love to get a free bowl that's been handmade by someone in the community. Uh, love a bit of soup and bread. Why not? Uh, what a great idea. But, and I had been thinking I'd love to go and attend one. It never occurred to me, actually, that I could create one myself. Because the idea st it started in the mid-'80s, and it started to spread really quickly around the US and was taken up by uh, high schools and universities and community groups. And it, it spread quite quickly, but there was nothing that I was aware of over here in the UK. So I figured maybe I could create something like that. And there's a, I approached Vodafone, Vodafone the the mobile phone company, and they every year they have a scheme called the World of Difference Scheme, where they where people can apply for with an idea to assist a charity, and if they like the idea, they will support you in uh, working for the charity for a short period of time. So I, I proposed to Food Cycle that I create an empty bowls event on their behalf to try out the idea, see what would happen. And fortunately, they, everyone was happy to take part of it, and it was I was off and running basically. So. The next thing I needed was to secure bowls. Where am I going to get a large quantity of bowls? And the obvious solution for me, I'm based in Cornwall, was to approach the Cornwall Ceramics and Glass Group, which is a lovely, really welcoming organization of, of amateur and professional potters. It's just basically a loose network across the county because it's a very rural area. And uh, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I didn't know what my reception was going to be if I spoke to them because I know it takes a long time to make a bowl. It takes a lot of work. Uh, but I spoke to the chairman, Barry, and he was very supportive. He said, I'm convinced that the members would be happy to donate bowls because it's for a good cause. And, and he put the word out on the network, and very soon I was inundated with bowls. It, it was brilliant. I, you know, <laughs> I felt like I was on some sort of mission driving across the county to, to finding different potters in their studios in different nooks in, of the county. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I had strange assignations where I was, it's going to be in, under the bucket next to the pump on this road, on the, side, on the side of the road, pulling up and lifting up the bucket, not knowing what I was going to find. I was getting packages in the post and unwrapping them. And it was like Christmas every day, unwrapping a package, going, I have no idea what these pots are going to look like. And a fantastic, fantastic collection of pots, all donated from the goodwill of potters in the area. And so I had some pots, which was great. Next thing I needed was a venue. So I approached St. Hugh Harvest, which is a lovely farm shop and cafe in North Cornwall near Wadebridge if you know the area. And they, they do a whole range of fantastic food-related uh, events. They have a, a raw food evening. Uh, they grow their own produce. They are part of a community veg box scheme. They raise their own pigs and chickens. Um, and they also produce, in my opinion, the best brownies in the Southwest. So I highly recommend, if you're into your brownies, come down and check them out. So I spoke to Antonina, the proprietor, and she was very happy to support the event as well. And, and again, this is throughout the whole project, I was really overwhelmed by the generosity of all the people I spoke to. So many people were keen to take part. And I kept thinking, but there's no money in it for you. I'm not, I'm not paying you for the services. I'm not paying you for your pots to use your space. But people were happy to take part because they believed in the idea behind it. They liked the idea of community, of dealing with food waste, of dealing with food poverty. So they bought into the ideas underpinning it, which was really, really inspiring for me and really motivational. So I kept going with the idea. So I, I, so I had a venue. I had the bowls. I'm going to show you some of the bowls here. They, they were just fantastic and such a brilliant mix. So this is Carol Scott, Frances Osborne. Uh, the woman who came home with that bowl actually came back and said, Can I, do you have any more by this artist? And in, and in fact, I did. I had an extra one by the same artist, which looks slightly different. She said, oh, can I have that one as well? I'll pay, f I'll pay the same, I'll make a similar donation for that bowl as well. So again, so then two bowls went, which is absolutely lovely. Um, 
This is Penny McBreen. Penny McBreen has a lovely pottery in Weybridge, uh, which is again in North Cornwall. When I spoke to her about the project to begin with, I mean, she produces beautiful, beautiful ware. Uh, I was like, oh, I don't know if she'd be willing to give me one of her bowls because they, you know, they can, they're really nice. And she said, oh, absolutely. Here's a bowl. I've got one right here. You can take this one. Really? I can just have that? Said, absolutely. No problem. No questions asked. Have a bowl. And then about a week later, she rang me up and said, actually, Jeremiah, I've got three more for you. If you have to come down and pick them up, you can have those as well. And it's just brilliant. The generosity was absolutely overwhelming. Uh, this is Teresa Pracy. Uh, Heather Swain, she produces very colorful well, wear. Noreen Todd. Now, it was the, a lot of the people I spoke to were from the Cornwall Ceramics and Glass group, and Noreen is one of the few glassmakers who's a part of the group. And she works primarily in fused glass in making wall art. So she hadn't actually made a bowl before, but she was keen to take part. So we had a discussion. It's like, ah, I don't know. I, I don't know much about glass myself. But we, we had a little discussion about how she might go about slumping glass into a, a bowl form. And I was explaining, well, it has to hold hot soup, so it's going to it's got to handle the heat, the, the temperature change. Someone's got to be able to carry it. Just talking through the logistics of it, she went off and experimented. She took it on as a creative challenge. How can I make a bowl with materials that I'm used to using? And she created a, a new form, which was completely new for her. It was new for all of us, actually. It was really exciting. So it, she took square pieces of glass, two of them, fused them and slumped them. Because it's square, it's got corners, which actually act as handles and dissipate the heat. She tested it, made sure it could handle hot liquids, and it was, it was fantastic. It was a really lovely, creative response to the challenge that was put out there. And I, I, again, here's someone willing to take time to try to find something new in order to support the idea, which was just lovely. Um, Georgina Cominos, Lema Grigoni. Lema actually heard about this because uh, I also approached the Falmouth University in, uh, yes, oh, do you know Lema? You're a student there. Oh, with Lema, fantastic, yeah. So it's really, really exciting that um, some students also decided to take part as well. They have a great craft course down at Falmouth University. So Lema's on the course, she's from Latvia, and uh, she produces some fantastic, fantastic bowls. And what was lovely about them was uh, looking at them, I couldn't figure out how she had fired it because they're, they're perfectly round on the bottom. There's no foot ring, but they're glazed on the bottom, they're glazed on the inside. I figured, is it possible that she fires them on the rims? So she, and I actually emailed her and said, Lema, how did you do this? She fires her bowls on the rim. So she glazes both sides and then puts it upside down on the kiln shelf. And what that means is it distorts the rim of the bowl. The bowl is not perfectly circular anymore. And that actually becomes a feature of the bowl. And it means that it's got a lovely curved bottom and they rock just a little bit. So I was learning something as well. I was like, this is great. It never, never occurred to me to fire a bowl like that, which, <laughs> which is just lovely. Uh, who else do we have here? Andy Thomas gave us some bowls. Jay Guest. And, uh, Jay Guest gave us a massive bowl. That was a fantastic bowl. Um, Paul Jackson. Paul Jackson is very well known as a ceramicist in Cornwall. He has a lovely uh, gallery and pottery in Helen Bridge. Uh, this is Jenny Phillips. Rowan Fodden. Rowan Fodden was the woman who was teaching me uh, how to throw at, at the Adult Ed College, which was about an hour and a half drive from me. And through the winter, I'd make the trek up to where she was so I could get access to a wheel and clay and to, to someone who has a different approach to ceramics. So that was great that she, w she was willing to donate bowls as well. And actually, Rowan, Rowan said, Rowan, I, I asked her if she'd be willing to donate some bowls. She said, sure, I'm sure I'd come up with a couple for you. And then when I actually arrived, she had six for me, six bowls. So again, it was like, this is, this is above and beyond what I was expecting. I'd hoped that if every potter gave me one or two bowls, I'd have enough for the event. And, <laughs> and, and everyone kept giving me more than I anticipated, which was just lovely. Uh, this is the other bowl by Francis Osborne. Um, Chris Wooten. Chris, Chris is also on the craft course at Falmouth. And he's, uh, he, he's not a ceramicist. And he wrote me a lovely note and he put in with this bowl saying, um, I'm learning to throw on the kick wheel. So he's teaching himself to throw on the kick wheel and he's using free clay, he put it. What he's doing is he's collecting all the scraps, all the terracotta scraps from the other students that they're discarding and he's, he's He's uh, recycling that clay and then learning to throw with it. So he's keeping his budget really low as well, which I really appreciate. There's a, there's a tradition of thrift amongst potters. And so Chris is taking part on that as well. Uh, and this is Barry Marshall Johnson. Barry is the chairman of the Cornwall Ceramics and Glass Group. So he was the first person I spoke to who said, yes, definitely we want to take part. We want to support the idea. And he donated several bowls as well. And he has a lovely practice as well. 
So I had my bowls, I had my venue, and I, I was inviting guests to come along to take part in the first Empty Bowls event to happen in Cornwall. And it was really exciting, but I had a, a difficult question. With all of these lovely bowls, these really eclectic mix of bowls, some were very professional, very, some were by people just starting out, wide range, some were by people who were very well known in the area, how do I ensure that everyone is happy with the bowl they get? And I figured the best way to do this is to, is to insert an element of randomness. So I created a butterfly lottery, which I figured the, the fairest way to do it. Every member, every person who came in was given a little origami butterfly, and the butterflies had a, a number attached. In each of the bowls, there was the corresponding number. So if you had number 10, you had to go and find the bowl with the number 10 inside. And so we had a lovely moment in the evening where everyone had, had to hunt for their, their appropriate bowl. And the act of, of randomness and hunting and trying to find it made it, well, it made it quite entertaining, actually. And one of the reasons, I, one of the key things I wanted to try to create in the evening is that, is that it was fun. It was communal, it was fun, it was engaging, it was informative. Because underlying it all, we're talking about things like food waste and food poverty, social isolation. These are things that are they're kind of sticky issues. They're, they're sticky conversations to have. It's not very comfortable to talk about. I wanted to raise awareness about them, but I didn't want to, uh, but I wanted people to also to feel, to leave the evening feeling uplifted and positive about what they've experienced. So we had a great time it, uh, exploring, having a hunt for your bowl with your corresponding number. In. The bowls also had contact details for the potter who'd made it, so people could get in touch afterwards. And in fact, several people spoke to me afterwards saying, I love my bowl. I can't wait to send an email to the potter to say thank you. It's so great. Or I want to go and try to visit them in their studio to learn more about what they're doing. So it was really, really positive response to the bowls. And the other thing I found really exciting is that People saw different things in the bowls. A bowl that one person might thought is a bit brown, a bit murky, someone else would see all sorts of other things in it. People were finding beauty in their own bowls and very quickly felt a sense of ownership over their bowls, which was really, really nice to see. There's a lovely moment when um, uh, a young boy, he must have been eight or nine, came because we, we had a counter where we were serving the soup into the bowls. He came up to the counter and he had the biggest bowl of the night. Because I had asked the potters to give me uh, ideally soup bowls, bowls that could hold about a cup's worth of soup. But <coughs> I had quite a wide range of pots and sizes, and he had absolutely the biggest bowls. This quite small boy, this very large bowl, it was bigger than his head. And he was standing there getting some soup in his bowl, and with him was his dad, who was over six foot tall, who had I genuinely the smallest bowl that had been donated. It was it was it was perfectly formed a little bowl. It was lovely. But there he was with his little bowl and they were both absolutely over the moon with their bowls. And I made it very clear to the father, you can come back as often as you like for refill. So it's a small bowl, that's not a problem. And uh, so it was thrilling to see how, how quickly people ex uh, fell in love with their bowls and felt that they, they had a sense of ownership over them. We had a lovely evening. We had lots of soup from food that had been donated by uh, the local supermarket. And I spoke a little bit about both the Empty Bowls idea that they were now a part of and the work of Food Cycle, the charity that we were supporting, th that the event was in support of. And at the end of the meal, I invited everyone up to, to a wrapping station. That we'd, we'd had a lovely meal, we'd cleaned the bowls, so the bowls were now nice and clean, and encouraged people just to, to wrap them up, to take them home. And as you can see, there were some fantastic creations. People really, <laughs> really got quite excited about the idea of protecting their bowl and making it a safe journey home. So that, that's essentially how the evening went. And you, all of the proceeds that we, we raised went directly to the charity Food Cycle. And if, you're, if you'd like to learn more about Food Cycle, you can check out their website. It's a really nice, really quite vibrant website. Uh, and if you're interested in cooking, and in any way interested in taking part, the nearest hubs are Bath and Bristol, and they're happy to take volunteers at any point, and it really is an exciting thing to do. It's an exciting way, and a way to spend an afternoon and evening. And I, the only caveat I say is if you do go, be prepared to go back because you might find it addictive, because I certainly did. I, I left that night having cooked that meal absolutely buzzing with ideas and enthusiasm. It was so exciting to take part in that. And, it, it's, and you're doing it for such a good reason as well. I, it was just really, really inspiring. So I highly encourage you, if you're ever in the area, 
to give them a call and offer you services. Uh, St. Hugh Harvest is a lovely farm shop and cafe in North Cornwall. I'd say the brownies, fantastic. Feel free to check them out if you think you've got better ones. I'm happy to try them. Uh, and the Cornwall Ceramics and Glass Group, a brilliant organization based in Cornwall. One of their members is actually here today. It's Nick Harrison, who's over in the, in the marquee over here. And he produces some lovely leech, and, leech tradition inspired pottery and ceramics. Um, and that's essentially it. So I'd just like to thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. And I'll be around in the tent as well for the next few minutes as well. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.